next speaker is James Andrews. Is he over here? And uh, James has been uh, a cooperator with the BMC since its inception. He is coordinator of the Vermont Reptile and Fitness Asset and adjunct professor teaching in the Rubenstein School at UVM and chair of the Reptile and Amphibian Scientific Advisory Group to the Vermont Endangered Species Committee. I do. I'm involved in two types of, of uh, amphibian reptile amphibian monitoring that are funded by the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. One is intensive amphibian monitoring at uh, selected upland sites, Mount Mansfield and Lybrook, where we're monitoring amphibians and we get like 25 data sets over the course of the summer. And it's particularly use, useful information, but it's uh, it's a selected subset of amphibians, and it is also in protected areas that are not being developed and don't have some of the same threats <coughs> that you might see if you're looking statewide. So, plan. So, another type of monitoring that is funded by DMC is extensive monitoring, where we're looking at the whole state and I'm trying to establish a baseline look for changes in species presence and absence, numbers of populations, locations, extensive ranges, uh, to get data which we can then use for listing and permit decisions, and to do it in a way that involves the public as much as possible, and then provides that data back to the public, to the reptile scientific advisory groups, to landowners, to schools, to whoever wants that kind of information. So it's a citizen science project in part, because we're trying to get as many people involved as possible to, to send us records and photographs, but we also get certain chunks of money where we can actually go out and target certain species and certain habitat types. So there's those two types of monitoring going on. But one of the benefits for the extensive monitoring and, and getting off those little protected pieces of land is that your data then reflect the amount of habitat remaining. And that, for me, is just a critical factor, one that I'm concerned about all the time, that you know, back in the 80s, we were losing approximately 10 square miles of habitat every year, 6,150 acres per year. And that slowed down a little bit to about 7.5 in the 90s uh, square miles per year that we were consuming or taking out of biological production. And clearly, in my mind, there is no way that we can expect to take a non-renewable resource like that and consume it and still have the same level of biodiversity and to still have uh, equally healthy ecosystems. Now, right now, that figure is probably a little bit lower given our economy right now, but I wanted to do a type of monitoring that, that reflects the amount of habitat, forest health, but, it, but forest in the sense that Michael Snyder mentioned it briefly, just forest, not only just mountaintops, but forest in terms of naturally vegetated landscapes from the mountaintops to the, to the borders. You know, the, the whole, the whole uh, enchilada, because, um, you know, early successional habitat, uh, floodplain habitat, everything. Uh, community types and juxtaposition, I mean, I, I, I talked to, to a, a mentor of mine, uh, Mike Clemens from New York City, uh, and he's talking about the protection of all these little wetlands. And it was very nice to have these isolated little wetlands that were protected, but none of the upland forest habitat that those reptiles and amphibians needed was associated in that protection of the habitat. It was just this little buffer around some little wetland. So 
we can look at um, juxtaposition of, of habitat types, community type, parcel sizes, connectivity, physical and chemical management, what chemicals are we using out there on the landscape, climate change, disease, including some new ones, introduced species. So there's just a wider variety of factors that we're looking at. And we've been doing this for a long time now, since 1994. Uh, five, uh, 500 different contributors uh, each year, uh, over 90,000 records in the database. So we're getting better and better maps. But there are three species that I wanted to bring to your attention that have dropped off the radar screen in recent years. And one of them is this one, the boreal chorus frog, the one on the left. The boreal chorus frog could easily be confused with the spring peeper, this guy. It's a little frog about the same size, same genus, Sudapus. And it also is one that likes grassy habitat, grassy open habitat, like the peeper does. Uh, but if you look at these two species, this one has usually some rough form of an X on its back. And this one has three longitudinal lines or maybe rows of spots. Now this particular species was never widespread. It certainly is an edge of range species, but it's not what you might expect. You might have expected an edge of range species that was at the, maybe at the northern extreme of its range, and, and as we warm up, or uh, as climate changes um, would eventually get pushed out. But this particular guy reached down into um, Franklin County, Grand Isle County, and then down to Plattsburgh on the New York side. And we actually didn't know about it at all back in, in the 80s. We didn't even know we had it. But, but looking backwards now at some of the records, we have records that go back uh, into the 50s for that particular species from New York State, not from Vermont. And the Canadians, who are also seeing declines in that species, um, in their recovery plan, which we don't have, we don't have a recovery plan for that species, but they have, and they list habitat loss as the main threat to that particular species. And I can see why they would say that, looking at the areas around uh, Montreal um, as being a particular threat, but when I look at Grand Isle County and Franklin County, there seems to be plenty of grassy, uh, Habitat like this, ditches, um, essentially imagine a vernal pool in the open with grasses. Um, there seems to be appropriate habitat there. So I, I have my doubts that, that it's strictly a habitat loss situation. So what else could it be? Well, it could be some sort of fragmentation issue where, um, okay, something happened. Combine that with a winter weather event. This is a short-lived species. It's only lives a few years, maybe three years. So if you had bad breeding conditions, maybe you have relatively little water available in the spring for two, three years in a row, or if you had a disease come through, it would then be wiped out in a very short period of time as opposed to a spotted salmon, it would take 20 years, you know, because it's a long enough species. So, so something short term could wipe it out, but then can it recolonize? Can it get back? Is there a source population somewhere nearby that would that would provide the recruits that could get back here, and can they travel across the landscape? Um, I can't help but wonder about farm practices in terms of certain chemicals. I mean, there are chemicals out there like atrazine, and there's more and more information coming out about atrazine and its effects on amphibians. And as you know, it's a widely used chemical in Vermont, and we're talking about agricultural territory, Franklin County and, and Grand Isle. But the honest truth is, we don't know why this thing disappeared. But the last time it was seen or heard was 1999. And, uh, and we did have some efforts. Mark Ferguson for, from Fish and Wildlife did spring surveys repeatedly over a number of years. And in the last time you heard, you heard this one population that we had left in Alberg was 1999 two frogs. So that one, uh, we lost some of them. Another one at the southern extreme, Ballastoe, down in the southern end of the Connecticut River Valley. And Ballastoe, again, has a lookalike species, which is the American toad, which is really widespread. It seems to be doing pretty well. It seems to adapt pretty well to suburban and, and, and rural development. But Ballastoe, like sandy soils, which 
we have a lot fewer of to begin with, but it also likes disturbed soils. And, and one of my potential hypotheses for that one, actually, let me step back. How do you tell it from American toad, the one that we see all the time? Well, Fowler's toad, in these dark spots, Fowler's toad has no large warts. All they have are all these little warts, numbers of little warts. They actually are a different color. But here you see these large warts. And Fowler's toad has a clear underside. American toad has all that spotting on the underside. So with a little practice, you can tell them apart, and they have a radically different call, which is even easier. This sometimes is described as uh, somebody strangling sheep in the distance. <laughs> you know, it's not a pleasant warbling call. And you can listen to it online. But you can see that it was a Connecticut River Valley species, and it does continue <coughs> down into Massachusetts. Um, the last time I saw one was in Vernon. And I had a graduate student from Antioch, New England, do some survey work for me, and she did some survey work up and down Connecticut River Valley. And in her whole project, she couldn't, she couldn't find it. You know, she could no longer find it. And with this particular species, I wonder about some other things. Because it likes disturbed soils, um, I wonder about just our control of the Connecticut River, the damming of the Connecticut River. Because if you had extensive flooding along the Connecticut, you would be disturbing a lot of soils pretty regularly, and you'd be depositing sand and open gravel, which they use. Do I know that's the case? I don't know that's the case. Could it have been some disease issue? Sure. Is roadkill an issue? Sure. Roadkill is a huge issue with toads. I don't know if you've you've had that experience. Once once you've developed a search image and you kind of tune into amphibians on rainy nights on roads, it becomes hard to drive at certain times of the year because you're aware of them all over the road. But toads in particular uh, forage on the roads. They're not just crossing the roads. They go out and sit in the roads and they eat all those dead insects and eat the, the worms that they see crawling across the roads. And they just sit there and you can see, you know, you get stopped for driving like a drunk driver as you're trying to weave between the toads. And so if you're, if you're a species that has a low population to begin with, maybe roadkill uh, in that area is enough, but I don't think so. I think something's going on. I think there's some sort of synergistic effect that is affecting that particular species, some combination. Weather event, I mean, with climate change comes some of these erratic weather events, such as if, if you dig in the soil to spend your winter uh, maybe a foot down in the sand, and then uh, we lose our snow, and then we get a deep freeze, so that you don't have the snow to insulate you, then you could have a winter kill event. Amphibians, the amphibians that we have that are freeze tolerant are freeze tolerant down to about 21 degrees Fahrenheit. And you get below that, if where they are gets below that, then they die. We have no evidence at all that this one is even freeze tolerant. So we would think this one would die out at above freezing. And interestingly enough, some of the good soil data that we've that we've gotten from, from BMC shows us that in most cases, when you get below the snow, the ground doesn't even freeze. If you keep the snowpack, the ground doesn't even freeze. And so you can be safe down there. You know, let me just throw out a whole other one. Oh, zero minutes. Sorry. <laughs> the last one that I want to mention just briefly is the racer. And uh, we were able to find racers up through 2008. Now, in this particular case, there are a couple residents that have reported, no pictures, no hard documentation, but particularly large black snakes in that area up through 2010, which makes us a little bit hopeful that maybe we're just missing some of these individuals, but I personally have spent a lot of time looking for that particular species. It's look-alike is the rat snake, which is a western Rutland County species. The racer is a Southern Connecticut River Valley species. There's where it once was, but we have not found that one since 2008. This one has some, other than habitat loss, this one covers, the ones that we had radio transmitters on, covered a range of up to three miles, just a huge territory. And so it's hard to imagine how you could travel three miles as a large snake without having to cross some roads somewhere. And funders, 
and question or leave? I think we need to hold off on questions just so we can fit everybody else. Okay. But thank you very much. Yeah.